This week's topic is one branch, one well-defined well school of embodied approaches to cognition, specifically ecological psychology. Now, ecological psychology as a school is indelibly associated with a single founding person. This is James Gibson. Although Eleanor, his wife, did a great deal of work in the field, and the field has grown and has indeed sub-schools within it, it's always to James Gibson that this particular strand goes back to. Gibson did his PhD before the Second World War in 28, I think, and he was interested in visual psychology as it was at the time, where the dominant tradition was, of course, behaviorism and the approach taken to um, behavior was couched in terms of stimulus and response. He was very unhappy with this. And in the Second World War, he was in the Air Force and his job was to uh, prepare and study the materials needed to train pilots to land planes. Um, he was also interested in how people um, cope with the task of driving cars. Uh, this gave rise to a series of books in which his ideas developed. There are three of them there. The Perception of the Visual World in 1950, The Senses Considered as Perceptual Systems in 1966, and The Ecological Approach to Visual Perception shortly before he died in 1979, which is the most mature statement of his contribution. As you can see, Gibson is very interested in uh, vision as it serves the carrying out of specific tasks. Now, ecological psychology does not aspire to being a complete psychology. That is, within the broad domain of psychology, we find very, very many concerns. And ecological psychology is specifically concerned with perceptually guided action. That is a very narrow view of um, what psychology might aspire to being a theory of. It is also not ecological in a plausible sense that we would um, bring to bear in the time of the Anthropocene after the um, ecological mutation and the conditions of planetary change. There we're going to need a much more developed notion of ecology and interbeing. What instead, what Gibson gives us is a radical inversion of the way in which one approaches the question of perception. The famous quote by Mace here, ask not what's in your head, but what your head is inside of, illustrates the shift in the form of inquiry that's pursued here. Rather than um, assuming that the senses are somehow impoverished channels through which um, sensory information gets to an inside in which it's then reassembled into some form of representation. The switch here asks us instead to look at the embedding of the organism in its physical environment and to see to what extent the lawfulness that inheres in that regulation can be exploited in the service of action. One key concept, just to start you going here, is the notion of optic flow. Imagine the plane flying here, if you will, and imagine what's actually happening on the retina of the pilot as the plane flies. Well, the plane is possibly steering towards a cliff, in which case the visual elements of the cliff will loom. They will get larger as the plane approaches it, just as if you approach any rectilinear surface, that it looms and gets larger. This means that the pattern, the optical pattern on the retina is itself expanding. And contrast that with what, what's happening on the retina as the pilot glances down, where the ground is moving, shearing, um, as the plane flies over it. So we get a very different um, vector, a very different dynamic of the change in optical texture on the retina, providing two very different kinds of information, one about an upcoming collision and the other about our progress through space. Um, 
the visual system is here not conceived of as independent in any sense from an action system. The visual system is a motor system as well as a sensory one. And the optic array describes the um, rich resource that the world provides us through reflected light, which is informative about position, movement and activity. Um, so this is not an eye-based theory, but a whole body-in-environment-based theory. And with that, in the years that Gibson worked, a lot of certain themes got, became developed, and as the School of Ecological Psychology grew, these have turned into minor industries in themselves. The first thing to note here is that in the literature of ecological psychology, you find frequent reference to the organism or animal and its environment. The reference to animal I have always found extremely problematic. Gibson himself describes animal environment relations. These days it's far more common to say organism environment relations and that tells you an awful lot about what kind of program this is so we won't admit any um, technology for example. Any, um, it, this is couched in terms of the encounter of an animalistic or organismic body with whatever surfaces are around it. It does not use the notion of information as developed in the Shannonian sense, which is, applies to the passing of messages through channels. Instead, a different notion of information is curated within this school, that of ecological information, which is task specific. A difference that makes a difference in the conduct of a task may here be described as information. Within the approach taken here, perception and action are con completely inseparable from one another as indeed are the organism and the environment. The environment should not be think of as a pre-given world just there and the same for all beings in it. Rather, we're going to characterize the environment as it appears to an animal. This is a theme we'll be exploring next week in the work of Jakob von Uxkull, rather more uh, in rather more depth. No animal, as Gibson says, could exist without an environment surrounding it, but Equally, and not so obviously, the environment implies an animal to be surrounded. So the manner in which we characterize the environment is going to specifically depend on which organism or animal we're talking about. Perception here, as is used for the guiding of action, is non-representational. And this brings up the somewhat problematic but um, very important term of direct perception. So direct perception not mediated through mental representations, but direct perception on the basis of invariance in the stimulus array that surrounds the organism. Those are some key themes and concepts which you'll be reading about. Um, another very important technical term introduced by Gibson, although the idea, as we'll see next week, was around before, is that of an affordance. An affordance um, is an intuitively simple idea that tries to um, develop the concept such that perception is intrinsically meaningful, is meaningful from the bottom up, not that meaning is added to a process of image capture or something like that, but the perception is intrinsically meaningful. And we can illustrate this with a simple example. If you ask um, about steps, on stairs or around the campus on UCD, you're familiar with the notion that not all steps are well constructed and that some steps seem to afford climbing rather better than others. In particular, there are some steps in UCD in, on the campus that are very small uh, with great distance between the steps and they always have the effect of interrupting your walking. How should we describe the climbability of a step? its suitability for stepping on or the climbability of a, a set of stairs. Well, the first thing we must notice is that the height of the step is going to be important, but not the height of the step measured in inches or centimeters, but the height of the step with respect to the leg length 
of the person who's climbing the stairs. So this notion of an affordance, the climbability of the stairs, needs to in um, include both the body-centered properties of the one doing the action and the uh, physical characteristics of the environment as me. We can speak of the graspability of a cup, for example, which is not a property of the cup or a property of me, but a property of my possible set of relations with the cup. I can grasp the cup, I can pick it up. I see the cup as something that I can engage with. Despite the fact that this is, represents a fairly simple intuition, it has given rise to a lot of debate in the literature. Here are two attempts, neither of them entirely satisfactory, to describe the to define the affordance concept as the relation of possibility between animals and their environments, we might add in their activity, or as the opportunities for interaction that things in the environment possess relative to the sensory motor capacities of the animal. Let's look at one of the greatest hits of the ecological tradition. This is the work done by Lee and Reddish on diving gannets. It's a, an example of the clever application um, of the concepts of ecological psychology to a well-defined empirical case in which um, observations are made about lawfulness in hearing in the relation between the organism and its environment that fundamentally change what we think perceiving and acting are. Gannets dive from a great height to catch fish. As they do so, they need to keep their wings out extended in order to be stable during their dive. If at the point of contact with the water the wings are out, they will be ripped off. Dive birds are diving very fast. So at a critical moment in the dive, the gannet has to retract its wings. How does it know how to do that? Because gannets are very good at this. Well, with a lot of simplifying assumptions, we can model this situation as the gannet approaches the water. We have rectilinear approach to um, a single textured surface, which means that we have a very good idea of what's going on on the retina of the gannet. There's this expansion I spoke of. Furthermore, the mathematical development of this theory demonstrated that if you consider one specific variable known as tau, which describes the rate of change of a textured element on the retina, divided by its distance from the center. So we have a mathematical description of how um, a textured element on the retina is, is expanding outwards. That variable turns out to have units of seconds. Its units are time and specifically time to contact with the water. So that the job of pulling in the wings at a specific time has now been reduced to um, a much simpler a job of causing the wings to come in when the time to contact passes a critical value. So by studying the manner in which the gannet is embedded in its environment, we can understand what the gannet is doing as non-mysterious, hugely reducing any explanatory load we might place on the brain. Another example of this is given by some rather nice experiments done with swaying rooms. As we stand, our bodies sway ever so slightly. Um, we are, in fact, somewhat unstable, and as we sway, so the optical, the texture, optical texture on the retina slightly pulses. This is entirely unconscious, but as you lean forward slightly, everything looms. As you lead backwards, everything recedes. And in a series of experiments, it was demonstrated that you can manipulate this. Normally, rooms stay still, but if you cause a room to sway, you can actually cause someone to fall over, as shown in this little video, which is rather How dated. How important, then, is this visual information in maintaining balance? In most adults, even when doing a difficult task, the sway is small and balance is easily maintained. But if visual information is important, then it should be possible to upset a subject's balance in an experimental room by moving the room gently forwards or backwards. 
infants learning to stand are less stable than the adult and far more easily put off balance. The infant in this experiment has only been walking for a month. When we move the room backwards, the child falls. And again. In 92 trials of this type, seven infants, balance was clearly disturbed in the predicted direction in 82% of the trials. It seems then that for the infant learning to maintain balance, visual information is far more potent than mechanical information. Notice the texture on the walls there. These walls have visual elements so that you couldn't see it very clearly in the video, so that there is visual information about the moving walls. We'll be lucky to have uh, Tony Shimero joining us in class this week. Uh, and for that reason, I'm setting chapters six and seven of his book, Radical Embodied Cognitive Science as Required Reading, and one journal article, which is the history and philosophy of ecological psychology. These both serve to give you a big high level overview of the field and through Tony's book also some of its relation to other approaches to embodied cognitive science. Interesting to note that last year there was a special issue of the Frontiers Journal which um, looked at complementarities and um, issues arising when ecological psychology was compared to inaction which is the um, destination of this module. It elicited 35 papers, which absolutely did not reach any kind of consensus, showing that the um, various schools of embodied cognition that we are considering do not necessarily unify easily, even though they have some very urgent common concerns. I've provided a lot more readings on the web page for you there. You can dip in and out of those or treat it as a resource for later if this approach um, captures your imagination. Okay.